Hey everyone, our topic this week was requested by Satarel Dracul. We'll be going over the story of Ganon's various incarnations from the Zelda franchise. Okay, so first things first. When it comes to Ganon, there are a couple of names that those very familiar with the Zelda games may know and be finicky about. The name Ganondorf is generally used to describe the character in his humanoid form, while the name Ganon is often used to differentiate him in his monstrous form. For the purposes of this video, we are just going to call him Ganon. Because, whatever the form, they're all variations of the same guy. Now, for the five of you who aren't familiar, Ganon is the primary antagonist of the entire Zelda franchise, appearing in nearly every one of the games. The Zelda franchise has existed for 33 years. However, a few years ago, an official timeline for the Zelda games was released, revealing that all of the games existed in a kind of shared temporal continuity. The timeline has had two revisions since its release, but importantly for us, it gives us a timeline for Ganon's life and story. It's still a little convoluted though because, well, time travel. So strap in and let's get started. Chronologically speaking, the first game in the Zelda franchise is Skyward Sword. Unsurprisingly, this is where Ganon makes his first appearance. Sort of. This game's ultimate antagonist is Demise, and he is the outlier for the Ganons in the series, predominantly because he was the first from which all of the following Ganons would be born. The blueprint or skeletal structure, if you will, on which all future Ganon-esque villains would be based. From a story standpoint, that is, because Skyward Sword is actually one of the more recent games in terms of publication date, but you get the idea. Because of this, he is also the least Ganon-like of the set. Skyward Sword takes place in the early days of the Zelda universe, early enough that an often referenced goddess, Hylia, still walked among the people. One of Hylia's duties was to safeguard the Triforce, arguably the only thing in the Zelda series as iconic as Link, Zelda, or Ganon themselves. Very briefly, the Triforce was an object filled with the power of the three greater deities who formed the world. When whole, it had the power to grant any who wielded it the ability to do pretty much anything. When separated, it generally splits into three pieces, also called Triforces. The Triforces of Power, Wisdom, and Courage, generally held by Ganon, Zelda, and Link, respectively. Hylia's stewardship duties put her in direct conflict with Demise, an extremely powerful demon with aims to take the Triforce for his own and rule slash destroy everything. Standard villain stuff. Ages before Skyward Sword, Demise and his armies clashed with Hylia and her forces. In the ensuing struggle, Demise was sealed away, but Hylia was forced to allow herself to be reincarnated in a humanoid form in the aftermath so that she could, among other things, maintain the seal locking Demise away. Flash forward to the events of the game, and servants of Demise are working to see the seal on his prison broken, and Demise freed once more. At the same time, Demise himself made several attempts to break himself free on his own, locked in the form of the imprisoned. Not his true self, but a relatively powerful manifestation regardless. Especially considering he's half sealed up and trying to break free of a prison created by a god. It should be noted that if the Imprisoned makes good on its escape, it's a game over, inferring that without Link, the player's interference, Demise could have broken free on his own. As it stands, however, Link and company resealed Demise repeatedly over the course of the game until they themselves get their hands on the complete Triforce and basically wish Demise out of existence, ending him forever. For about five seconds because almost immediately afterwards, the same loyal servant of Demise, who had been trying to revive him this whole time, kidnapped Zelda and traveled back in time to a point where the Triforce hadn't been used to erase Demise. Turns out Zelda was the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia, what a surprise! And using her soul as a combination of fuel and key, Demise was freed at last, stepping foot outside of his prison in his full might for the first time in ages. Link faced him down, surprising Demise, who noted that no creatures of such courage existed when last he could breathe free air. The two then did battle, with Link slaying Demise. With his dying breath, Demise leveled a curse upon Link and Zelda, proclaiming that Demise's sheer hatred was too powerful to die, and that an incarnation of that hatred would follow future incarnations of Link and Zelda for all time, binding the three of them together in an eternal ring of struggle, darkness, and death. And presumably because, with time travel, this event occurred before he was unmade by the Triforce, that curse stuck. Which is how we get Ganon. Ganon is the reincarnation of Demise, or at least his hatred and power. And interestingly enough, despite differences in the stories of games that were released over a 30 plus year period, canonically speaking, the Ganon in almost all of the Zelda games are not just reincarnations of Demise's hatred, but almost all of them are actually the same Ganon. 
nearly always being either sealed away in one game and breaking free the next, or being legitimately resurrected after a true death by some fanatically devoted minion or other. In each of his appearances, Ganon has a few core traits, most of which he shares with Demise. Firstly, after Demise, each version of Ganon possesses the Triforce of Power, for at least a part of the game, which, as the name suggests, grants him unfathomable levels of power. He is always, without question, the most powerful character, good or evil, in the game. With victory over him requiring some combination of cunning, deific power, magical artifacts, and teamwork between several lesser beings, whether that's just Link and Zelda or they're being directly aided by others. Ganon is rarely ever seen without the power of the Triforce behind him, but even when he is, he's generally skilled in martial combat. His human forms tend to wield swords, while his more monstrous guises usually use either natural weaponry like horns or a trident, though of course exceptions exist. He also always has some manner of powerful magic at his disposal, and most importantly, he's very smart. Or at least, very villain smart. He still generally ignores the hero until Link comes kicking down his door, and has definitely checked off egomania on the list of his personality quirks, but he spends a good deal of his time manipulating events to occur to his liking, as a proper big bad should. A great example of both his power and manipulative abilities comes in Ganon's first chronological appearance, Zelda Ocarina of Time. I know, I thought it was earlier too before researching this video. In this game, we learn that Ganon is king of the Gerudo. Think desert Amazons, and he wants to expand his power by taking the Triforce. Thing is, by this point in time, the Triforce is locked in another dimension, and the only known entranceway requires three keys, and the ability to pull the Master Sword, otherwise known as the Anti-Ganon Sword, from its pedestal in order to open the gate. In pursuit of this goal, Ganon screws over each of the Guardians of the Three Keys when they refuse to cooperate and hand over their respective key. While doing this, he also ingratiated himself to the King of Hyrule, the land in which most of these games take place, so that he can, among other things, gain access to the actual door he needs to step through to claim the Triforce. Long story short, Link and Zelda trying to thwart him collect the three keys and Link draws the Master Sword, which is when things go sideways. Link was placed into a seven year stasis, apparently because he wasn't ready to wield the Master Sword. But the sword was drawn and the keys were in place, so the door was open which meant that Ganon was able to step through the portal and seize his goal, the Triforce. Except that it turns out if a person with an unbalanced heart touches the Triforce, the pieces are scattered and the person who touched it is left only with the piece that most speaks to him or her. In Ganon's case, power. His presence in evil also corrupted this other world in which the Triforce had been resting, but that won't really be important until later. Ganon then spent the years while Link was asleep conquering everything and looking for the other two pieces of the Triforce, since presumably they wouldn't split again, even though his heart was still unbalanced. But eventually, Link awakened from his slumber, all adult and not at all atrophied, magic stasis for the win! And working with Zelda, currently one of the seven mystical sages, defeated and imprisoned Ganon in the other world. While being locked away, Ganon promises to eventually break free and return to Hyrule and exact his revenge on all their descendants. Since among the Triforce of Power's nebulous abilities, apparently agelessness is a thing. This is where the Zelda timeline, and thus Ganon's timeline, gets tangled in ugly knots. Ocarina of Time acts as something of a hub for the Zelda timeline, in that, prior to Ocarina of Time, temporal events progress in an orderly fashion. Time is linear, just like we're familiar with here in the real world. But once we hit Ocarina of Time, the story of Zelda's world splits into three distinct timelines. One of which shouldn't exist, but hey, multiverse time travel theory is a thing. So, these three divergent paths are created by the following three events. One timeline is created if Link dies during the events of the game. The second is created when Link is victorious, defeating Ganon and placing the sword back in the pedestal, which sends Link back in time to live his life from that child age onward. The third is created by Link being victorious and leaving, but we then watch what happens to that adult world that he left, rather than assume it gets unwritten by child Link's actions. So, quick recap. Hero defeated timeline, Link dies. Child Link timeline, Link lives and we follow the world after he goes back to being a kid. Adult Link timeline, Link lives but we follow the world he leaves behind when he goes back to being a kid. Which should just be written by the Link as a kid timeline, but hey, what do I know? Multiverse theory is a bitch. Okay, I feel like you're referencing something and I don't get it and that's not fair. We're gonna start with the adult timeline, both to get it out of the way because Terran hates that it exists, and more importantly because it has the fewest Ganon occurrences. 
Specifically, Ganon is next seen in Wind Waker. Before the events of the game, Ganon makes good on his promise from Ocarina of Time to escape that other dimension, returns to Hyrule, and starts wreaking havoc. The thing is, this generation's Link has somehow causal looped himself out of existence by returning to his life as a young boy. So, no hero rises to combat Ganon. Instead, the people of the land plead to the gods for help and mercy, and in response, the gods tell everyone to get to higher ground and flood everything, trapping Ganon in an underwater prison for a few generations. However, much like his dimensional world prison, Ganon escapes his underwater confinement as well, taking to the high seas, which is now just about everything, in pursuit of the other Triforce pieces, as well as laying plans to ensure he can't be locked away again. He actually initially succeeds on all fronts, but is outdone in the end regardless. He finds both Link and Zelda, holders of the other two Triforce pieces, manages to trick Link, again, into drawing the Master Sword, as while the sword was sealed away, the sword was sealing most of Ganon's power away. But he didn't stop there. Ganon also ensured that the sages responsible for empowering the Master Sword so that it could do its job, you know, harm and seal Ganon, were all slain, rendering the weapon nearly powerless. But Link escaped Ganon's clutches after finding out his trusty sword was useless, fixed it up so that it could work again, and then he and Zelda faced down Ganon once more. Unconventionally, Ganon subdued both of them, ripped away their Triforces to form the whole Triforce, but was beaten to the wish by another character who had been waiting in the shadows. His plans thwarted, Ganon engaged Zelda and Link once more, only to be defeated by having the Master Sword plunged into his face and turning him to stone while the whole area flooded around them, leaving his petrified, shish body buried beneath the sea. Which is Ganon's only appearance in the adult timeline. Scooting on over to the child timeline, Ganon next appears in Twilight Princess. Here, Link returned to his child body and time, and was seemingly able to expose Ganon for his crimes, both current and intended, leading to Ganon being captured and sentenced to execution. Which is when we see arguably the most overt example of the power granted to him by the Triforce of Power, as in Twilight Princess it is revealed that either Ganon had possessed the Triforce of Power all along, and it was simply dormant, or that it could be called to its worthy wielder by need or strength of will. Since, while Ganon was chained to a great stone slab and stabbed through the midsection by this game's version of the Seven Sages, he didn't die. As a side note, we can't help but wonder if Ganon would have survived if the Sages had just known to aim that dumb sword a few inches higher up. Who executes someone by stabbing them in the gut? Instead, in that moment, Ganon's ability to use the Triforce of Power, however it came to be there, awakened, keeping him from death and even allowing him to break his bonds and kill one of the sages in the process. He was banished, however, to the Twilight Realm, where he pulled a similar trick to his last dimensional prison, managing to escape back to Hyrule generations later, but this time by duping and using the denizens of the Twilight Realm to help him. All of which culminated in a fight between he, Link, and Zelda notably this time momentarily possessing Zelda during the battle, before Ganon was finally run through a second time, this time impaled on the Master Sword, although in the same spot, for the first time in this timeline, ending Ganon's life rather than sealing him away. Ganon next appears in Four Swords Adventures, not to be confused with Four Swords, which came before Ocarina of Time. This time, being reincarnated after his death in Twilight Princess, once again as a Gerudo man, but this time, rather than being their king, he was an outcast, having broken their laws and gone plumbing the depths of ancient ruins in search of power. Ganon spends the majority of the game working the shadows to throw the land into chaos so he can secretly grab more and more power, tricking Link again into drawing the Four Sword, the magic sword of importance in this game, and releasing Vati, another reoccurring villain, in the process, so that Link and Zelda would have something to focus on besides Ganon, while he quietly made it harder for Link and Zelda to confront Vati in the first place since if they couldn't get to the villain they knew about, they wouldn't go searching for the one they didn't know existed yet, and collected power for himself in the shadows. Eventually though, Link and Zelda slew Vati, and then confronted Ganon, finally sealing him within the Four Sword as Vati had been, before magically locking the sword away, presumably so no one could draw it again. Which is the last we hear of Ganon in the Child timeline, bringing us to the Hero Defeated timeline, and oh boy does he show up a lot here as one might expect since he had to win in our of time to create this timeline. Ganon is first encountered again in A Link to the Past. In this timeline, Link is defeated in the final battle of Arc Reign of Time, enabling Ganon to acquire all three pieces of the Triforce, but Zelda and the rest of the Sages were still able to seal Ganon into that other dimension, which in this game is originally called the Sacred Realm, but became known as the Dark World after Ganon corrupted it. 
Ganon sits in the Dark World, corrupting everything and bending it to his will, building armies and etc. for several generations, until eventually he manages to work with an evil wizard in Hyrule to send seven maidens, descendants of those seven sages, including the current incarnation of Zelda, to Ganon in the Dark World to break the seal. However, before too much damage could be done, Link tracks down the wizard, defeats him, probably with a simple bug-catching net, and then does the same to Ganon, actually slaying him for the first time in this timeline. Ganon is kinda sorta encountered again after this in the dual games Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages, as well as in A Link Between Worlds. In the Oracle's games, the main conflicts of each game were ends to a means, with two witches seeking to revive Ganon. To do so, they used a ritual that required them to cause havoc in two lands and then kidnap and sacrifice Zelda. They do everything except sacrifice Zelda, as Link arrives to intervene, but desperate for success, the witches then sacrifice themselves instead, returning Ganon to life, but only partially, as he mostly seems to be a mindless, violent husk of his former self that Link quickly slays. Ganon then makes another appearance in A Link Between Worlds, but again, not as a true antagonist. Instead, an evil wizard, a different one, revives Ganon and fuses with him in order to co-opt the use of the Triforce of Power. But the fused Ganon wizard is eventually slain by the Link of that game, and you never really encounter Ganon individually. Which leads us to the final Ganon-touched game in the Hero Defeated timeline, and the game that started everything. The original Legend of Zelda. In this game, Ganon has once again returned to life through unknown means, and has led an army to ravage Hyrule, obtaining the Triforce of Power in the process. Zelda, fearing what would happen if Ganon obtained the Triforce of Wisdom, split it into several parts and hid them throughout Hyrule, sending a loyal servant to seek someone capable of defeating Ganon. And you guessed it, Link is found. After collecting all of the pieces of the Triforce of Wisdom, he defeated Ganon, reducing him to Ash. No mention of the Triforce of Courage in this game, by the way, it didn't show up until the sequel. Ganon kind of appears again in said sequel, The Adventure of Link. In Adventure of Link, Ganon's minions want to kill Link since, unusually, they could use his blood to revive Ganon. But Link never dies canonically, so nothing ever happens and Ganon stays dead. It should be noted that if the main character does die, the game over screen is Ganon laughing because he was able to return to life. This ultimately brings us to the last Zelda game in the timeline and the most recent release, Zelda Breath of the Wild. Nintendo has stated officially that Breath of the Wild is at the end of the current timeline, though there has been no explanation of how that works. Whether that means that all three timelines will experience the events of Breath of the Wild before more games take place in those three respective timelines, or that all three timelines somehow converged prior to Breath of the Wild, making it the first game in a newly unified timeline, is unknown, though most people seem to lean in the second direction. By the time of this game, people have stopped forgetting about the consistently reappearing Ganon, and have instead begun to prep for his return, such that, thousands of years before the game occurs, a literal army of machine automatons and four massive weapons platforms were created as backup for that generation's Link and Zelda to assist in their fight against Ganon when he emerged. He did so, obviously and was promptly sealed away. Presumably, no muss, no fuss. Thousands of years pass, people let things go by the wayside slash purposely bury all of the robots, and 100 years before the game begins, everyone realizes, oh crap, Ganon's coming back soon. So they dig up as many of the robots as they can find, give them a nice spit shine, and prep the weapons platforms for duty. Ganon shows up, and a couple of things go very, very wrong. First, Ganon apparently wasn't super happy about being blasted by an army of laser-wielding robots millennia prior, and upon his breaking free of containment, promptly corrupted all of them, even manifesting powerful corrupted units to kill the champions piloting the mobile weapons platforms, and gaining control of said platforms as well. Add to all of this the fact that Link was nearly killed by the corrupted army of machines intended to fight Ganon, and everyone was having a very bad day. Luckily for Hyrule, when the chips were down and everyone else was out, Zelda was able to use her power to lock Ganon into Hyrule Castle proper. Mostly. She held him there for about a hundred years, while Link slept in a healing chamber and recovered from his nearly fatal wounds. By the time Link arose, once again with no atrophy because magic is awesome, Zelda's containment was on its last legs. Ganon's influence could be seen around the castle from almost anywhere in the kingdom, his malice took a physical form in the shape of a caustic ooze that appeared throughout the realm, he could periodically bring his monsters back to life, and, of course, he still had a modicum of control over the corrupted machines. His power grew and Zelda's strength waned in tandem every day while Link regained both strength and memory. 
with Ganon even going so far as to start trying to make a body for himself in preparation for Link's arrival. Was Zelda too strong for Ganon to do this before? Was he just lazy? Does it take that long? We may never know. But ultimately, Link and Zelda face down Ganon one last time. Ganon's initial body incomplete but still powerful, and it's entirely possible that it might well have been the very last time. Because while battling Ganon's final form, Zelda claims that Ganon tried to go nuclear, forsaking his ability to reincarnate over and over in exchange for gaining power more immense than any he'd possessed before. Note here though, some sources do say that in the Japanese version, Zelda actually says that this same power is born from Ganon's refusal to die, i.e. he'll keep reincarnating rather than the other way around, but we can't confirm or deny this since we don't speak Japanese, so we're not sure what this does to the canon. Whatever the case, Link and Zelda triumph by all appearances slaying Ganon for possibly the last time, at least chronologically. We all know Nintendo's not done yet. And that's basically Ganon, the ultimate antagonist of the Zelda franchise. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave us a like and share the video around. Word of mouth gets us much more traction than anything we could do. If you have ideas for videos you'd like to see us do in the future, do like Satariel Dracul and let us know in the comments down below. If you'd like to see more videos from us in the future, be they lore or let's play, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, this has been True, True Masters, Masters and Morons, Morons signing, signing off. off. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to see more like it, hit this subscribe orb. To see our last Let's Play, click or tap the link on the right. For our last lore video, go to the link on the left. And for a video chosen by the gods of YouTube from our channel, hit that link on top. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching, watching, and we'll, we'll see you next time. time.